ইসলাহিন <laughs> respected brother and sister assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh our great pleasure to welcome sheikh advocate sayed faiz all the way from india uh may allah bless him and bless this community to unite it community for the gathering here may allah subhanahu wa taala bless us this mosque we just nearly uh nearly ready but long way to go uh we need lots of fund also alhamdulillah and uh bazaar everywhere from around the world giving the fund hopefully and give more um i'm very pleased to um be here i'm very shy also with uh, sitting next to the sheikh uh advocate sayed um jazakallah khair brother abdul kayyum who give me opportunity to sit next to him and i'm going to hand over to him that he's going to give introduction about him uh jazakallah khair assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh for the speaking brothers and sisters it's a great pleasure in uh, inviting and having the company of our brother here said bias who said face ali Uh, who has many accolades in fact he is the founder president of the islamic research council uh, sorry center in uh, arunabad and uh, the president of al hatib education and welfare society the president of ilm foundation the president of the azam ali said public library the managing director of huda al huda education foundation and many 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 more in fact one of the things which a lot of people would be knowing for is uh, a non interest based islamic uh, banking system which uh, the brother has been championing and inshallah i'm sure this is a discussion for another time but we will inshallah uh, in time ask him to uh, address that topic now it gives me great pleasure in inviting him to talk today about the age of youth um and i'm sure he will enlighten us jazakumullah khairan before we do that uh, they we would like to um, gift him with uh, the book that uh, sheikh shuaib hasan has uh, has uh, penned and this book is called the concept of the mahdi among the ahl sunnah al jamaa and this book has been part funded in publishing by our masjid here al masjid al ikhlas uh, cambridge islamic center Now one of our trustees and our uncle Uncle Abdul Latif we would invite him if you could please kindly make this uh uh gift to him jazakumullah khair and can I also invite you to sit there please afterwards uncle no 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 give it that present from the master of us enjoy it inshallah all praise and thanks are for Allah alone who is the creator and sustainer of this universe and peace and blessings be upon his last and final messenger inshallah this the topic of my today's lecture will be about youth or youth age and what is the responsibility of parents in context to their children inshallah before starting this lecture i would like to give a clarification or just a disclaimer that uh, i am a urdu speaker and inshallah aziz i will try to speak in english but uh, the choice of words may be not so good so please try to understand what uh, i mean to say 
So inshallah this uh, today I will speak something about family life or the youth age. First of all I I think so uh, uh, all of us whether we are muslim or non muslim we know the importance of youth age and the importance of youth in a community. If suppose a youth of a community they are guided they are on the right path so we know the future of this community is bright and if the youths are misguided and if the youths are indulging into evils like we are seeing in today's world then we know we don't have to be a scholar to say or to predict that the future of this community is into dark because youth are like backbone of a community and this is very important that we as a parent or we as a community should take care should be very critical we should have planning for our youth since that uh, what i can say early ages like when they are kids we should have planning and then when they will become youth we should teach them what is to be as a youth in islam what is the importance of youth in islam so inshallah i will touch some points that what is the importance of youth age in islam so that if a person who is in the youth age he can understand the importance of his age and we as a parents or a guardian we can understand what is the importance of youth age so that when our children they are growing from kids to youth age we should teach them that into what age they are going and what is the importance of that age and what should they do and what should they avoid so allah, allah uh, so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book he has revealed us a chapter chapter number uh, 18 which is surah al kahf and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has ordered us or has uh, uh told us that we should recite surah al kahf every juma and whoever recites surah al kahf every juma we know that in the surah al kahf it starts with a story of people or the youths who have believed in allah so uh, in other words allah rabbul izzat has commanded us to recite story of the youth every juma so i think so this explains to us what is the importance of youth age okay the second thing is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have told that allah rabbul izzat will ask four questions on the day of judgment and every one of us has to answer that question the first among that is where you have spent your life the second question is where we have spent our youth age the third is how much knowledge we have gained and how much we have uh, practiced upon that knowledge and the fourth question is from where we have earned and where we have spent so if you analyze in this hadith the first question is where we have spent our life and the life includes youth age but then also there is a second question which says where you have spent your youth age your young age so i think this hadith itself shows the importance of youth age that allah rabbul izzat by asking a question about the life which includes youth age is asking second question about where you have spent your youth age because when a person is young he has energy he has time he uh, has money he has all the resources which are needed to practice and to worship deen or religion islam and to worship allah subhanahu wa taala and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said in one of narration which says on the day of judgment when there will be no shade except the shade of the throne of allah subhanahu wa taala there will be seven person under the shade of the throne and the one among the seven is the youth who has spent his age in obeying or the youth age in obeying and worship allah subhanahu wa taala so i think so this hadith is explaining in itself the importance of youth age okay in one of the narration the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this is very uh, what i can say uh, the narration in uh, jami tirmizi and very popular one which says do take care of five before five and in that one he says that take care of youth age before you are old okay so here also the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is emphasizing on the youth age that when you are youth when you are young take benefit of that age before we are before the old age approaches us so here also the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has emphasized or sh- has shown us the importance of youth age but the problem we are seeing in nowadays that uh, as a parent as a responsible person 
as a what I can say head of a family, we are not taking care of our children in terms of their upbringing, especially in terms of Islamic upbringing. And we are not taking care, we are not uh, uh, giving them time. And when they are grown up, when they are youth or when they are adult, we are expecting them to be our uh, obedient. They should be listening to their parents and they should uh, listen to what their parents are saying to them and they should do everything what their parents expect them to do. But the problem lies here that when they are young, when they are kids, when they, their youth age is there, we are not guiding them according to Islam what is the importance of their youth age and, what, and we are not giving them the tarbiya which is the need of the hour so that when they will grow up they will be inshallah obedient to their parents. So I will inshallah uh, discuss some points uh, uh, in which we will see how can we have a better communication with the youth so that they should listen to their parents, they should be obedient to their parents, they should follow the teachings of Islam. The first and foremost thing which I will, uh, I will keep in front of you is that we are in general as a parent, we are expecting our youth our children to obey us, we are expecting them to do good things, we are expecting to them to be religious, we are expecting them to be studious, everything. But the problem lies here, we don't have a system of communication in our homes, like we don't talk to them, neither we listen to them. This is the basic problem. We have uh, broken homes, we have broken relationships, we have many problems. But the problem uh, but we are not studying what, the, what is the reason for this problem. The reason for this problem is we are not communicating with each other, especially with the children and youth. They are disconnected from the parents, they are disconnected from the elders of the, of the family. And when they are grown up, we are expecting them to be obedient to us. How it is possible? So first and foremost thing what we have to do is if you want a youth to be uh, living his life or to be listening to us, to be living his life according to Islam, the first and foremost thing what we have to do, we have to start communicating with them. We have to start to talk with them. We have to start to listen to them what they are saying. We are so busy as a parent or as a, uh, as a responsible person of a family or head of a family. We are so busy in our daily routine or daily life or in our work that we hardly get time to talk to our children. Hardly get time to talk to our children. Sometimes we see we are coming back from the office and half work of the office we are doing at home and when we are at home, the children, our children want to talk to us. They want us to listen to their issues, what they have done in their uh, daily life. But we don't have time. We are busy in texting someone. We are busy in some, some kind of work, some sort of work we are doing on our gadgets and we are busy. So. There is a kind of what I can say no communication between us. We are not talking to them and hence the issues are increasing day by day. So first and foremost thing we have to do is we have to talk with our children. If we don't talk with our children, how, is it, how it is possible that they will be obedient to us when we are not communicating, we are not talking to them. Generally, I am seeing in our, in our Muslim families, the parents or the elders, they are just looking to the children and they expect that the children should do what they are expecting them to do without saying anything. Like just seeing and you should understand that what parents, are, parents want you to do. This is something which is common. But generally I say to people, if there was an ability in human being to just look to someone and a person just by seeing someone, he can understand what he, meant to, uh, what he wants him or what, uh, what the other person wants us to do, then this power Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given to the prophets that they will see to their ummah and the ummah will understand the message of the prophet. But we, we, we are seeing that the prophet used to talk to the ummah. They used to call to, to people. They used to call in what I can say in gatherings and they, when they, the people were alone. They used to call them in day and night. They used to talk to them. They, they used to explain to them what Allah wants them to do. So we have to talk to our children. This is the first thing what we have to do. If we want our youths, our children to listen to us, they should be obedient to us. We should talk to them. And the second thing, we should listen to them what they are saying. Because many a time they have their own issues and they want to talk to us. 
and we said uh, no we don't have time inshallah we will talk uh, sometime later we will talk uh, at night and when the night approaches we say inshallah tomorrow we will see uh, and and the, the tomorrow never comes which is generally we say and uh, the child uh, we are seeing is not is his not attached with the parents as the case should be that he should be attached to the parents and when this child grow grow ups that time when we grow old and they grow young that time we are expecting that now they should listen to us but when they were young we don't have time to listen to them so this is a problem there was an incident in the in the life of the umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an that a, a father came to umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an and said and he he was complaining about his son and when he approaches the khalifa umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an his son was there with him the son told uh, to umar ibn khattab o amir al mu'minin just first listen to me then listen to my father so umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an said okay just say what you want to say he said what are the rights of children upon the parents first i want to ask this question so umar ibn khattab radiyallahu an told the first right is to select a religious uh, mother for uh, for the child means when a person is getting married he should have a, a, a wife who is a religious so first is the selection of mother for the child first right the second right is that when the child is born you should keep a good name of the child the third right is to give uh, the talim and tarbiya to the child the fourth right is uh, when he gets uh, adult you should get uh, he should you should marry the child then the child asked amir mumin or uh, told amir mumin that my father is with me and he, he has some complaints but my father have not given my rights to me first of all he has not married to a muslim woman he married to a parsia a mujusia a fire worshiper so my first right of a mother was not given to me the second right good name he doesn't named me he, he has not given me a good name okay the third right talim and tarbiya my mother was not a muslim a mujusia so no talim no tarbiya i have got then amir mumin umar ibn khattab radiyallahu anhu told to his father that when your child when your children when your children are young you don't give them their rights and when you grow up old you expect them to give your rights so he dismissed the case of the father so it's very necessary that we talk to our children we listen to them we hear what they have to say their issues their problems and inshallah this when this will be the environment in the home then our youth inshallah will be guided they will be listening to us they will be listening to us when they are young when they are adult and when we grow up and we grow up old they will be inshallah this listening to us they will be obedient to us one problem i see in muslim families they complain that the youths are completely cut off from the family elders and they don't respect them the other issue what, what i find is we as a parent or a responsible person in the family we expect our children to give our rights and we are least bothered about our duties or the responsibility which we have just we are expecting that they should be obeying us they should be good to us they should be doing everything but we are what what i can say what are our responsibilities towards them we are not we are ignoring that and we are only expecting our rights from them the third thing is that we don't have a religious or deeni environment in our home that's why we are seeing that when our kids they are when they are growing and they are now youth or they are now adult they are they don't or what i, I can say they are least bothered about islam or what i can say islam is the last thing which they will think islam is the last thing which they will think that they have to do something like for example in our homes uh, we complain that our children they are not religious we are sending them to maktab they are not serious about arabic we are sending them for hifz classes they are not serious about that they we want them to study islamic books but they are not serious they, we want them to recite quran they are not serious about that we want them to go for salah five time but they are not serious about that but the problem lies here children have a or a child have a tendency that they will never listen to what we say they will do what they see us doing like for example a father is saying you should read islamic books and the child sees that father he himself does not read any islamic book he don't have any what i can say enthusiasm or he, he is not uh, in engaged in reading islamic books and he wants his child to read islamic books a father wants his child to be a hafiz al quran but he himself 
does not take pain or hardship even in learning a small surah of the Quran. But he wants his child to be half as a Quran. Okay? A father is saying that you should go for salah, but a child is seeing that his father is so busy in his work that he misses his salah regularly. Okay? Uh, in a family where we want our children to grow in an Islamic environment or we want them to be religious, but we see many of us as father and mother, we are not praying Fajr Salah. We are not praying Fajr Salah and we want our children to be, uh, what I can say, uh, they should be uh, praying five times a day. How it is possible? Because children have tendency that they will never listen to what you say, they will do what they see you doing. So first of all, if you want our kids, our young youth to be in Islamic environment, first of all, first of all, we have to do, we have to bring Islam into our lives. We should be doing those things which we expect our children to be doing. Okay. Fourth thing is that uh, many of us complain that uh, our uh, our children when they grow grow up and when they are youth. They are, they are indulged into many evils, many evil activities and I think so, I don't have to say you people living in United Kingdom, you know better than me that when the youth are, youths are not guided and they are not misguided, what kind of evil or what kind, they can land in what kind of evil, I think so, you know better than me. Many of the parents have complained me about uh, uh, the drugs that the, the children or the child is taking drugs when he's in the youth age or when he's going to college. Many are complaining, uh, complaining about different kind of things, different kind of things that they are uh, disobedient to their parents. Okay, then they are passing their time, they are not studying, many of the things. But the main thing is that that we are not concentrating upon them. We don't have planning for them. We should have planning for them before they become youth or the when they are kids. We have to have planning for them that my child now he will be a youth, he will be a grown up person, then he will be an adult person. We should have planning for that. But we are missing that planning. We are missing that planning and hence our children are landing into many kind of evils. Many kind of evils. Uh, many, for example, many people have complained to me that uh, we have put our child into a madrasa where he, is, he has become half of the Quran but now he is not praying not even single time now he has forget the Quran after two years we have sent him to Madrasa and he came from Madrasa but he landed into a wrong company uh, of uh, bad friends and now his choices of life partners have changed so drastically that it's not allowed or haram in Islam now what we should do so we are thinking, we are what I can say, uh, not understanding the problem that when they are young, when they are in the youth age, in uh, that time we have to do a lot of effort. We have to take a lot of efforts, we have to do a lot of hard work in the tarbiyah. And when inshallah in that age we are doing the right kind of tarbiyah, then when they will be, they will be growing up to youth age or when they will be adult, that time, inshallah, Aziz, they will not be indulging into evils. And what I will say, we should make our youths or we should train our youths in such a manner that they should be ready for their nikah as soon as they, they, they are adult. We have to do this. When I am saying we should make them ready for nikah, what, what it means? It means that it means that we have to make them such a responsible kind of person that he is as soon as he gets he is adult he should be uh, what i can say is responsible or he should be eligible for marriage like we are complaining that uh, my child is such a, of such and such so and so age but he is not responsible he is not earning he is not doing anything so what i will say we have to make them we have to what i can say involve our children into our decision making we have to empower them so that they should take decisions we should make them uh, in, uh, or uh, we should do a, a bringing of them in such a manner that as soon as they get adult they should be able to get married as soon as possible means they could uh, be able to uh, earn their livelihood okay they should know that what it meant to get married okay they should know the weaknesses and strong points among in himself and when he will get married okay 
so what what is to be to be living with a man or a woman after getting married he should be taught all those things in his young age so that when he will get uh, he will go into age of adulthood he we can inshallah this marry him as soon as possible one more thing which i i, I would like to say is that we are saying uh, we are seeing our youths they are into uh, what i can say uh, those kind of activities we are which are not fruitful like we are seeing our uh, youth indulging in uh, playing games to such a level that they are playing their games for 6 hours 8 hours or a whole night they are playing or indulging into this kind of games then we are seeing our youth into social media they are into social media and they have various kind of accounts and just they are browsing the accounts one after another checking just email then they, they are going to facebook then they are checking their whatsapp then back to facebook then they are doing all those kind of thing this is just time pass they are just browsing the internet day and night we are seeing so we have to teach them that where they have to spend their time okay we have to teach them okay the second thing we are saying that our youth they are spending their time and money into what kind of trends are going in in terms of fashion and they are uh, going for uh, to be up to date in the terms of fashion and trends which are going on and in that they are spending lot of money and and they are trying to copy or they are trying to copy someone whereas in this age we have to teach them that he should or she should be following the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when we are seeing our youth they are indulging into affairs affairs which are very common phenomena and i think so affair is a very small word in terms of uh, uk they are much more than to affairs than datings than live in relationship and all those kind of things and they are into that so it's very necessary that in their age of what we can i can say when they are kids and they are just growing and going towards adulthood we should teach them what is parda what is haram and halal relationship what is legal in Ill, illegal in islam we are not teaching them but we are expecting that when they are youth they should avoid all those kind of things then we are saying our youth indulge into drugs and this is very common i think so people are complaining that in schools also there are uh, the, the children are into this kind of things like drugs and i think so when a person uh, or, or a child is taking drugs i think so what kind of evil it will bring to his mind ment mental health and his physical health we know then we are saying uh, 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 what, what what i can say a very big evil which is what i can say the biggest evil in of our time is the pornographic content which our youth is accessing on the internet may allah save us from all this this kind of thing but this is a very serious issue we are giving our children gadgets we are giving them tv with remote control in their hand we are giving them mobiles and handset with a working and open internet connection and we expect them that they will not browse or they will not go to this kind of stuff it's very necessary that we should be very uh, what i can say attentive when we are giving our children this kind of media so that or at least we should first do their counseling teach them what is good or what is not good what they can see what they should not see what they can see what they can hear and what they should speak and what is legal what is illegal what is halal what is haram according to islam we are not teaching them and when they get addict to all those kind of things which i have explained uh, time pa uh, passing the time uh, or affairs or uh, drugs or this kind of thing then we are uh, telling them that this is wrong and this is uh, this is not right but the age of telling them or educating them had already been passed so we should be very serious in terms of uh, upbringing of our children inshallah this in the last uh, part i will uh, just give some guidelines to youth that what they have to do the first thing the common area where muslim youth should focus is that they should fear allah or Uh, the parents or the guardians or the responsible person of the family they should uh, what i can say inculcate in our children the fear of allah subhanahu wa taala that when they are alone or when they are in the company they should fear allah subhanahu wa taala this is the first thing which is called taqwa we should put in our children taqwa of allah so that inshallah these when they will grow up they will be fearing allah subhanahu wa taala and their youth age will inshallah this pass in obeying allah subhanahu wa taala and worshiping allah subhanahu wa taala first thing the second thing the youth should obey their parents because after allah and his rasul 
the highest authority in this world is parents and among the parents first is mother and second is father so youth should respect their parents mother and father the third thing is is that the youth should uh, engage themselves in acquiring knowledge islamic knowledge or beneficial knowledge this is the third thing they should engage themselves into acquiring beneficial knowledge or islamic knowledge the fourth thing the youth have to do is that they have to develop good habits or as a parent we should develop among them good habits good habits can be they should have good friends we should uh, make them to uh, or develop in develop in among them the good habit of doing charity okay then there are many habit good habits we have to inculcate in them or develop in the, among the youth good habits the fourth thing is that the parents and the youth they have to see that they should have good friends because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in one of narration that a person is on the aqida or belief of his friend so to uh, what i can say the youth should have good friendship they should be among the company of good people among those who are pious who are those who are obedient to allah subhanahu wa taala Uh, who are worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? So friendship is very important, and as a parent, we should be very worried about with whom our children are making friends or with whom they are living. The fifth thing is that the youth should be taught to utilize their time, to utilize their time because youths have time, and when they don't know how to utilize this time, they are indulging themselves into or what I said about gamings and internet browsing and into social media. they should be involved in real life they should be taught that where they have to spend their time and how they have to spend their time their day and night and the time which they have okay uh, in this uh, context uh, i will appeal to the uh, community centers and the masjids that they should have certain kind of program in which they should involve the youths maybe it uh, it's for uh, weekends when they have holidays maybe uh, for winter holidays if there are winter and summer holidays here so that this youth when they are free they should be engaged in community with the community with the masjid with the madrasa and they should they should be given certain kind of activities or there should be some kind of syllabus or curriculum developed for them especially speci- specially for them i have seen many mosque here mashallah many masjid here mashallah and they have uh, hundred of thousands or millions of pound as a budget for construction and for the infrastructure of the masjid and all those thing but uh, the budget for uh, programs for kids and youths and a curriculum or a syllabus or teacher or a maktab is very small for example construction cost is 2 million and the uh, cost for syllabus development and implementation is 25000 pounds this is very uh, very small because the structure masjid is also important but the main thing is the worshipers which are coming into masjid so we have to develop uh, develop the worshipers because many uh, in uh, when i was uh, from last uh, 14 days when i was on lecture tour i have given lectures in many many masjid which were previously churches and now they are masjid because churches were there they were made on very high price they were constructed very what i can say heavy construction that they are 100 years 200 years old but the main thing on which they have not focused and did what i can say hard work was the people to come into church so now they don't have people to come into church so they are, they are now selling selling the churches so this is the example what we can uh, take that those people they have done many good things in terms of infrastructure and in terms of building but the people who should come into church they fail in that so as a masjid we also should have uh, a, a program so that our youth our coming generation should have a attachment with the mosque maybe uh, through weekend schools or some kind of classes or some kind of activities which a masjid can have so youths should be taught to utilize their time okay and they should be taught to avoid wasting their time uh, the next thing is that the youth should be taught to avoid seeing listening or saying something which is wrong since that uh, what i can say they are kids their childhood we should taught them that should they should not see which is haram they should not listen what is haram they should not say what is haram if we are teaching them in this manner that see this is haram 
or abusing is haram seeing this kind of pictures or this kind of thing is haram listening to this kind of things songs and all those things haram and inshallah when they will get tarbiya like this when they will grow up they will uh, avoid all those kind of thing because they have been taught that this seeing of this kind of thing is haram listening to this kind of thing is haram saying this kind of thing is haram so we have to teach them and the last uh, point which i will say is uh, we should uh, get, uh, get our youth married as soon as possible means as they are adult we should plan for their marriage and i have taken the point already that we should make them responsible that when they are in they, they are adult they should be so much responsible that they can they should be able to get married so the last point is is that we should make them the youth as soon as they become adult to get married so inshallah this i will end uh, my uh, my talk uh, with a dua that may allah subhanahu wa taala make our children uh, the coolness of our eyes uh make us as a parent to do right kind of tarbiya of our children and may allah make our children uh, a sabab jariya for us uh, when we are in this life and when, when we are gone from this world wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin walhamdulillah rabbil alamin bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, invite questions and answers uh Check with answer your questions. Anyone would like to ask a question? Just put your hand up, and I'll give you the mic. Shukabu shukur. Oh, by the way, just to know, this alarm is just to make sure none of you fall asleep. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakumullah khairu shaykh Allah mashallah very good talk. I just want to ask you one thing: that nowadays the kids or the children or the youth. They are mainly interested in the social media. They would be sitting with their grandparents or with their parents, but they are busy with their mobile. How do you expect the parents to give them tajia or to give them lessons? Do you think that the social media or the mobile are actually the shaitan in the house? Is that? Brother has asked the question that uh, when uh, the parents, grandparents want to give tarbiya to the the children, grandchildren, but they are busy into mobile and all those things. So uh, in my lecture, I have uh, I have uh, the uh, uh, I have already said this that the tendency of a child is that they will never do what you expect them to do. They will do those things only which they see you doing. so they are seeing their parents not grandparents i will say their parents they are busy with the mobile phone and they are not giving them time so when they are growing up they have seen their parents they are not talking to them they are not giving time to them hence they have taken this route when they are free they are accessing this mobile and all those things and now when they are addicted to this mobile you know gadget and this technology or this media which is i, I can say if it is used in a wrong way it's haram but uh, it has many alhamdulillah uh, positive side also so when they are addicted to that and when we, now we are saying that they should listen to us it's very difficult now because they have a kind of addiction to the, this kind of gadgets so what i will say we as they are now addicted to this kind of gadgets we have to make certain kinds of program in which we have to separate our children from this kind of gadgets they can be with these gadgets for their education and uh, when they they need that but for the full time we are giving them the mobile phones and they are habituated with using it uh, without any reason sometimes we uh, just uh, as a what i can say as a person we just check ourselves then if uh, for a day our internet is off then uh, uh, we have a kind of anxiety our fingers want something to be scrolled and pushed and touched and we have kind of anxiety so same this is a kind of addiction and children or the child get addicted to this mobile and all those technology uh, much faster than the adults okay so what we now we can do we should have some kind of program in which we should have counseling for of our children or we should have restrictions for our children that how much or for how many hours they can use this mobile and all those thing or view the tv for how many time so we have to do certain thing that they, we have to when break this attachment of our young generation with this mobile and this kind of technology so we have to make certain programs if <coughs> abruptly we just will we snatch the mobile phone and will say from tomorrow you will not use it this will not be going to solve the problem 
because this is a kind of addiction and we have to de-addict them from this and inshallah when they will be away from this thing we can then talk to them and we can inshallah give the instructions to them or uh, we, should, we can instruct them what should what they should do and what they should avoid inshallah okay, in the last part you said when kids are young like they are age of marriage try to bury them very quickly and teach them responsibility with that. Could you please enlighten this word responsibility, like how we can make them responsible enough that they can take the responsibility of a wife? Yeah. See, uh, back at home, what I have seen uh, as a father in our society, the father till his death is the only person who will decide what the family will do and what they will not do. Even he is the person who will decide to whom he will marry. Okay? In our family. This is something which we have to accept. Everything. Even if a child is sitting in front of a Qazi and a Qazi is telling that do you accept this marriage? Uh, he will say, uh, I'll just ask my father about this because uh, the Qazi will say, no, no, this you have to say. So he goes, okay. And then inshallah, father, what I should do? He should say yes. So, uh, yes, yes, I accept that. So this is the uh, what a situation in which we are not letting our children to decide. Means we are not engaging engaging them in our routine work, and we are not empowering them so that they they should be a decision maker. And this is what I can say the the reality of this ummah. We are saying we don't have leaders, but the real problem is that we don't want to create leaders because one one leader is there up to his death. He wants no one should be leader in his community. So what I can say, just involve your kid into your decision making. When they are small, you can have mashwara. You can just ask them what is what they think about something or what they think that, for example, you give just a pound, I think so, to your child and say that purchase something of his own choice and he's just going and purchasing something. Now ask him why he has purchased this thing, why not the, that thing. And next time, if you find something which is saying is mashallah better, then you accept and say, yes, this was a very good decision. And if some, somewhere he's wrong, you can say, instead of this, if you have gone to that and there was an offer and you would have got instead of one, two, now he's learning. Now he's learning to uh, decide, now he's engaged with the family, he's learning how to make decisions. <coughs> and inshallah, this, when he's in that kind of situation, he will be a person who is a responsible person. But in our families, we are not giving them this chance. In our families, I am seeing a father is not talking with his son. And a father, when he wants something to be said to his son, the postman or the courier in between is the mother. The father is saying, just go and tell your son that uh, uh, I will not give him pocket money. The mother is going and telling that your father is telling now you will not get the pocket money. The son is telling, go and tell to your, your husband that uh, I will see how he will not give in the pocket money. Come on. And the uh, wife is going and telling, the son is telling, Inshallah, he will obey you. He is not, she is not telling the reality. Inshallah, he will obey you. So here there is a communication gap. Now of a, uh, for a son, his first role model is his father. And they are not talking. They are not engaging. And the father has not empowered the, uh, empowered the child to take decision. So I, I will say, since a very small age, engage them in your decisions. Ask them why, this, why they, have, they have given this kind of mashwara, this kind of suggestion when they were asked. And inshallah, from this young age, they will be engaged in the family, they will be engaged in decision making. And inshallah, this after engaging them and giving this responsibility, empower them to take decisions, small, small decisions. And inshallah, this, when they will grow and they will be adult, inshallah, this, they will be ready for the marriage. Mr. Kato, add the same question. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Let him finish and then you next. I have one question to how to unite Ummah in the breaking world. Every hundred yards there is a mosque, very beautiful mosque, but there is lots of differences between the mosque, one mosque people to the other one. And you keep the very good example and highlighting the Greenland mosque two, three weeks before. Some of the mosques are, you know, if one person gone from one mosque to the other mosque, they see differently, oh, this person, why he come, this mosque, so and so, and how can we make the differences uh, clear cut that we are one Ummah of Prophet Muhammad See, in the 
there is a narration of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in which he has said that shaitan now he knows that the person who prays salah namazi salah they will never be going to worship him but he has expectations that he will be able to make them fight among each other so the ulama uh, says that after tawhid the most important thing is ittihad unity of the ummah and the shaitan will first he will attack our tawhid so that we should do shirk if he is unable to make us mushrik then the second thing he will do he that he will this he will spread disunity among us among us okay some basic thing we have to understand is that every human being is different okay in the same manner every masjid and its masjid committee is different if they have certain rules and regulation different from our masjid that's something which we have to accept there is this is nothing that this, this is not to be said as disunity among the ummah but the unity among the muslim is unity by heart maybe we are racially or by color or by country but as a ummah or as a, on the in our heart we we feel feel the pain of the ummah we are united so we have to do what i can say like one masjid and the second masjid there we should have some programs where common gathering should be there of the musalli of the, that masjid or this masjid or the trustees of both the masjid or the trustees of the masjid in all of our area they should have a, a some kind of comi- committee like uh, back there in india we have some committees there there are various jamaats and masjid are working upon that they have certain committees like uh, muslim uh, numainda council uh, or the muslim uh, representative councils and all those things in which all the issues of all the masjid and jamaats are discussed and solved and they represent in front of the government also if there are some uh, issues there so we have to have something like that but we can't say that all masjid all uh, musallin all those will, will will get united but we have to do now how to have unity among the ummah this is a very important question because if i am saying that there, there is disunity in the ummah so the solution is that you have to stand with me then only there will be unity in ummah this is something which everyone is saying that there are disunity in ummah so what is the solution you stand with me this is the solution no the solution is that we should be upon the quran and we should be upon the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then and then only we can get united so people are saying that we as a muslim who are disunited but the solution is that everyone want that you should be in my party stand where i am and this is the solution for unity this is not the solution the solution is that that we should be upon the way of uh, what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the quran and what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said inshallah this when we will be ag- will we will be agreeing on this two point inshallah this there will be unity among them just now you have a question regarding the previous question you was asked about the marrying of children yes We know in Indian Pakistan when we live there, we basically marry our son and bring the wife in our home. Yeah. One, two, three, you can marry. I mean, every, everybody yeah. in the same house. But here is situation is different. We are already living in very small houses yes. in the UK. But don't you think that they should be financially strong enough yeah. to afford yeah. and look after them? Yeah. The brother, brother have asked a question, asked a question that. Uh, that year in uk we have small homes so is it not necessary that a person should be financially strong to get married yes that what I, that, that is what i want to say that we should make them eligible for marriage and it is the criteria for marriage that he should have the earnings for himself and his wife and the children which he will have so this is the criteria for the marriage so make them in or the what uh, uh, give tarbiya in such a manner that as soon as they are adult they should get married that means they are now responsible they know everything about the marriage and they are now earning so we have to do certain things but in our uh, in routine life we have we have seen that we want our children to get uh, education education he is now graduate 20 years i think so age post graduate it's now 26 22 years or maybe 23 years then we want them to do something more and more and more and a very long age is passing and i think so the environment which kind of environment you people are living in uk it's not feasible to, for a person to be for a such a long time without living without marriage so we have to make certain things certain arrangements certain plannings so that 
that our children when they are adult they are earning now they know the responsibility and we should try them to get married as soon as possible uh, uh, just an announcement i mean there will be food served so we request all brothers and sisters to remain after the the question and answers and not leave before food will be served so please stay uh, uh, just a question Shir, it's not related to the youth issue but the other day you spoke about microfinance i don't know in english language if you want to explain you how you work in english maybe it can enlighten people and obviously the next question will be back on the youth uh, 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 when I visited this UK last, uh, I think so since last 14 days, I am continuously uh, have been asked by people about uh, mortgage of homes and all those things here, what is going on. So what I suggested to them, that instead of I giving you reply, you can ask a mufti here, which is in UK based and he knows the environment, all those things, the situation here, he will be in a, in a better position to give answer. But what I can say is that we are asking this question now. After 10 years also when we will be discussing the same question will be asked that is it illegal or illegal, can we have this in this kind of uh, country and all those things. Instead of that, why we should not take a step further against the riba or against the interest based system and we should have something or we should plan for something that we should be non interest based and back home we have done that alhamdulillah we have done a system which is i can say a microfinance kind of system the system started uh, in 2001 when i was just uh, a graduate and uh, i was uh, in a mood to do some business and for a business i need money so i was uh, with my some of my friends and we were just from where we can have this money and how we can uh, do or we i we, some of us were in need of a two wheeler we need but uh, we don't have money and we don't want to go for uh, uh, interest based finance system. So what we did, we planned a society which we call a self help group. In that we planned, we were 25 members and we planned that each of us will give 1000 rupees every month and the money will be collected and the people will apply. There will be some responsible person, one, two, three, president, uh, secretary and treasurer. Their decision will be binding upon us and every member can apply for example two three four member wants loan this month they will apply and the society the committee the three members will decide to whom they can give the give the loan and 25000 will be collected and given to a person okay and 25000 was a uh, very handsome amount in those days because in those days we would have a two wheeler two wheeler motorcycle in 30000 rupees okay new okay so 25000 then the next month the 25,000 now next month also we will have 25,000 rupees but this system in this system it's not like some society which people are running here or BC in back in India and Pakistan they have BC it's not like that we have a system that the member who the person who will be a member of the society will have to give 1,000 rupees as a share amount for lifetime lifetime you will be giving 1,000 1,000 1,000 every month till lifetime until less <coughs> Uh, he want to be out of the society. He have to give one thousand. Okay, this is called share amount. The person who who gets the loan twenty five thousand, we create another account which is called loan account. Okay, so the next month, the person who has taken the loan will give one thousand as the share amount return, or the share value which he has to give, and one thousand he will return from the loan which he has taken of twenty five thousand rupees. So next month we get twenty six thousand rupees. So we keep aside 1,000 and we issue a second loan. The third month we give 27,000 rupees. The fourth month we give 28,000 rupees. Fifth month like this. And up to eight months we get 50,000 now. Because 1,000, the second month 2,000, the third month 3,000. On eighth month we can issue now two loans of 50,000 each. For, sorry, 25,000 each. Or a single loan of 50,000. We, we, are, we are able to do that. So this society in every 8 to 9 months it get double like 25,000 loan after 8 months it will be 50,000 loan after 8 months it will be 75,000 loan after 8 months it will be like this 1 lakh rupees loan and this is a very big amount in those days uh, Alhamdulillah many of the society member have bought their homes like for 4 lakh or 5 lakh there was a flat and they took uh, like they have some money 2 lakh and they told to other members that give your mem 
you have turned to me this month or I just you take the loan and give it to me, I will purchase home and we have done that, Alhamdulillah, but this was small society. So this system grew up, grew up and many people were getting, were getting benefited from this system. <coughs> so people are uh, used to come to us and they will say, we have to make a group and it will not be 1,000, 2,000 rupees per month. Someone will come and say 10,000 rupees per month because we are into trucks and our transport business. We need uh, uh, a lot more amount. So they used to get 2,50,000 per month. Some are getting 25,000 per month this time. So Alhamdulillah, as this system grew up uh, slowly and steadily, after 6-7 years, we have more than 75 societies, different kind of running. And we used to have 1 crore and 18 lakh Indian rupees coming. Just circulation, coming and just giving. And this was all, uh, what I can say, non-interest based system. Alhamdulillah, people, will, people were getting benefited from it. And Alhamdulillah, handsome amounts we were disbursing from that system. But this was not legal, in the sense that this amount of money is coming and going. And we were not legal to do this. In India, they were having two systems. One is Sahukar, a person who can, money lender, who can give certification. Second was bank. And we can, cannot be both of them. So we thought, what we can do? So we approached uh, or we uh, just checked uh, uh, there uh, are any provision in the law that a person who is not a bank or a money lender, can he lend the money? Then we came to a system which is called as cooperative system, credit cooperative. And in India, they have a Ministry of Agriculture in which they have a system that we can register a credit cooperative society there. And credit cooperative society can work as a bank, but it will not have facility of check. This is one drawback only. They will not have check facility, but they can run as a bank and they have a provision to run with 0% interest. So we are registered into that, 0% interest. And Alhamdulillah after that, uh, we have a branch in Aurangabad, then we uh, got uh, the permission for 12 states in India. Then Alhamdulillah, one after another, we started in 2009, we started opening branch in different states. Now we have 38 branches running with uh, Alhamdulillah more than 50,000 members and we are giving loans, Alhamdulillah, in Indian currency it will go to 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs, even this amount of loans we are giving to people which, uh, who are in need. And Alhamdulillah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of bank, but uh, we have don't have provision of a check only this much. So it starts with a small microfinance. So I, I was, when, uh, wherever I was asked this question of mortgage, I was answering this, that why not we start a society here? In our community center is there, this masjid have, is a community center, come masjid. So why not we should start something for finance also, something uh, as a, uh, uh, who can give money without interest to a community member, maybe he needs for his health, maybe he needs for uh, what I can say for a routine life, maybe for uh, purchasing a vehicle, maybe for something. And after that uh, we, uh, uh, after when, uh, after the microfinance, this institution uh, was registered and all those things, we uh, in this system. We just have the usuls of what I can say Islamic banking like Murabaha, Mudareba, Musharika, Ijara and all those things and the system started to what I can say earn profit also because Islamic banking is actually a business. So we started doing that uh, rules and regulation of Islamic banking into, into that but uh, we, we have never returned that this is Islamic bank, we, we write that non-interest based <coughs> banking system. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, then we started to earn money in that, that system because we were now into sales and purchase of things because Islamic banking works like that only. If you want to purchase this, for example, this uh, juice bottle and it is for 99 pennies and you are coming to the bank and saying this juice bottle I want to purchase, this is the quotation, 99 pennies, we will say okay, we will purchase and give it to you. We just buy this from the storekeeper and the storekeeper in general give us some percentage, two pennies, three pennies, four pennies a person to us, then that is our profit. Then we take that and we add a markup price that this will be now one pound and zero five, pen, or five pennies and we will sell it out to you. Now he has to give us a return. So this is our profit also in this system. And Alhamdulillah we are now generating profit also but we are not an investing uh, company or like that but we are a, like something like a bank working there. So I think so the laws in India and uh, here in UK are similar. I have also seen some co-op malls, cooperative malls and all those things. So maybe there is a provision in the law also and you can go for that and we can have membership and uh, as a masjid where spiritually we are, uh, what I can say, we are taking community ahead, we can inshallah this financially also take this community ahead. Uh, 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 so, uh, so coming back to the context of your, your, your talk. So, 
in the same challenges would have been there in Julian Sahab, China Sahab as well, right? So, are there an account of how they dealt with this? I mean, what were the challenges for youth then and for parents of the youth then? Yeah. Can I just add to that question that I've been asked for on the phone? Uh, similar question, but now there's an addition and a quote here is that if your children are already into that social media culture, how do you now retract from it? Uh, the brother asked the question about uh, are there any accounts or waqia or stories in, from the life of the Sahaba that what they used to do with their children, how they used to do. In uh, the uh, in the age of Sahaba, Tabain, Tabain, in the Salaf Salihin, we see that the the child was engaged into family life from very uh, his, uh, his early childhood. He was first uh, made a, he was first made to memorize the Quran, Hafiz of Quran, at a very very early age. Because of that, their minds were very broad, and the child was used to memorize things. And he can memorize when he can learn the whole Quran memorized. It's, it was very easy for him to memorize or study uh, the what, contemporary uh, subjects on, in those days, Asri Ulum, what we call it. Okay, so this they were doing. The second thing was that the Sahabas used to engage their children with them. Okay, they were there with the, them, with the father in the, their journeys. They were there at the shops selling things. Even they were small kids. They were playing also, but they were selling <coughs> also. They were engaged continuously. Like Umar ibn Khattab once he was in the majlis or the company, in the company of the Prophet and his son Abdullah was with him. And many Sahabas used to take their children in the, in the company of the Prophet, in the mosque, at the business points, in their routine travels and all those things. So they were with their father and that was the reason that the son was taking over the business of the father. Even though father was not old and now he was free to do something and the son was taking care of the business. But in our age, the problem is that we are thinking that the child should only get education. He is kept away from the real life and the real issues. Okay? He is kept away. He is not, uh, what I can say, not involved or engaged in our daily routine life. And we are just saying, Padne dos koi. Just, you take education and take education and take education. And after taking education for 20 years, suddenly you are saying, no, you have to be engaged into real life. And he is saying, he is puzzled. He don't know anything. So we have to do this. And when they have free time, you are not engaging them because in office, surely you cannot take them. In the family, we don't have any plans that how they will spend their time. Okay, The mother uh, uh, herself ha have a very busy schedule that uh, what she has to cook, she has to talk back home and all those things. Then there are gossips and all those things also involved. And, like busy, they are busy in doing. The relationship between husband and wife is such, <coughs> such a kind that they are, what I can say, in terms of relationship, the most, the people who are most near to each other. But nowadays we are seeing the husband and wife sleeping on the same bed, but they have their back to back and both are texting cut, 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 something and both of them don't want to show the husband what they are doing or the wife don't want to show the husband don't know. They are texting. Okay. This is the, our family life. Now in this life, when the husband and wife or the parents themselves are addict to all those things, all those things, all those gadgets and all those things, now how they can concentrate on uh, bringing up their children? This is the real issue. So in the time of Sahaba, the children were engaged into real life activities, real life activities, into business, into all those things. Even some of the Sahabas, it was made compulsory that they used to send their children for uh, sheep uh, grazing and uh, camel grazing, that they should go because this is the real life. They have to do this when they will grow up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, what I can say, it was, it was a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all the Prophet, which were there, they were all, the, all of them has grazed the sheep. They, they were doing this, okay? So this is very important. So they were in the real life. The second part of the question which brother asked that uh, how to retract our children, how to make them away from this all, uh, what, I, what, I, what I can say, when they, they are uh, intoxicated or so much involved into this social media. Uh, whenever generally this question is asked by many people to me, I say to them, if you have something, just explain to me because I am too in need of that. Okay, everyone is into need of that. But what I have done at my home and at my office, I can just give an example of that. At my home and at my office, it's not legal and no one is allowed to use smartphones. My office also same rule because we allow them phones. Like they can have 
simple uh, phones, small, not smartphones, and they can use our landline for calling and texting, no problem, inshallah. But we don't allow employees at my center, my hospital, that they should use smartphones. One, and this is something legal in India. It's not something against the, uh, what I can say, uh, against some rights or this is not uh, something, uh, what I can say, illegal in there. Because I, we are not blocking them to use phone. We are just blocking them to use smartphones. So they can call, they can text. It's uh, uh, what I can say, it's good. At my home also the same system because I, I have seen my children, they are engaging themselves into gadgets. If not mine, to someone else, their cousins and all those things. So what rule we made that if you are entering our home, you should keep outside this gadget, your phone, your smartphone. So at home we are using simple phones, we have two phones. When I am going to office, another kind of phone and when I am at back home, we are using another kind of phone. And my, I, my uh, myself, I am not using any kind of mobile phone at home, simply. At office only, I am using it. So I have made this thing. Second thing, when we are giving them gadgets like uh, uh, like uh, tablets and all those things, we have put some cartoons, some documentaries, which already we ha have seen and they are gone through us. And I ha we have put that. So they can browse the things which are already there in the tab. They cannot uh, uh, use open internets or open networks. This is what we have restricted. This is not against what I can say, uh, against, I am saying against uh, the children's or youth, uh, but this is necessary because if they are given open networks, it's high possibility that they will land into evil. So that's why we have pre-recorded things in memory cards and just the, we are attaching the memory card to the TV and children are seeing that. Or if we are giving our tablets, they already have pre-downloaded things and they can see and we have assigned a time. The time for uh, daily, they, they are 30 minutes they can watch. And after 30 minutes, they we close it and inshallah next day they will see it. And that too, if they are obedient to us, they are not doing mischief. If they are doing mischief, then 5 minutes cut, 25 minutes today. So each of them, the siblings, they will tell, don't do any mischief, huh? 5 minutes will be, we will be getting cut. So because of you, we, because all of them are getting 30 minutes. If one of them is doing something wrong, 5 minutes is less. So all of them are socially networking with themselves. Don't do this. Father will do this. If the, the mother will uh, come to know this, she will deduct 5 minutes. Then if something second wrong, 10 minutes, then we have to see only 20 minutes. And after the, that, they will say, don't do this next time. Huh? Else we will get some. So this, this, is, this is something which we have done. But I think so here, uh, the, the situa situation is bit uh, very uh, different here i have seen a, a child who cannot speak he is using that things he, he cannot speak but he knows where his cartoon is like a two year child or a less than two years he, he knows where the cartoon is and is just playing or he cannot type he is speaking and through voice command he is using those things so we have to restrict them first of all we have to make uh, the, them eligible for using this thing at a certain age we should age restrict that that after three years only we will give them after four years we will give them and then time restricted thing will be and the content restricted thing should be there Some more questions. Questions. Um, how do we teach our children and uh, protect them from same agenda relationships because it's in schools and also um, no agenda children with no agenda can you just repeat the question uh, the sister is asking uh, about um, uh, same sex same, education okay. and same gender or people have joined a gender crisis. See, in this kind of uh, uh, situation where the law of the land uh, allows many things and uh, the same situation is there now in India also. In 2018, the Supreme Court of India allowed same-sex marriages and all those things. So the problem is there now in, back in our countries also. So what is that? At a very, very early age, we should teach our children about sexuality according to their age. We have to teach them. Some of the other way. Okay? According to age appropriate. Why I am saying age appropriate? Because uh, uh, for example, uh, a child of a 7 or 8 years here, his understanding level will be much different than, than a child living back in India. In India also, if he is living in a metro city, the understanding level will be different. In a one tire city, understanding level is different. So, age appropriate content should be made and they should be taught slowly and steadily. Many things. 
age approval like in 6 years 7 years i think so in school they are teaching it because <coughs> there there should not be hate crimes against those kind of communities okay i think so this is their agenda because of that they are, have made it compulsory that it should be taught in the school so first of all you can just uh, if this is something exception means uh, uh, it's not compulsory to have this education then you can just pull it, pull out your child that for this lecture he will not be there but if it's compulsory then we have to make something or some kind of curriculum or syllabus through masjid or through homes or through educated people teachers that so that before the school teaches them we we teach them what is right and what is wrong what is right and what is wrong and we can explain them in what i can say age appropriate manner for example like uh, my child i can go to example my child my i was having my, my fourth child and the the eldest one was now 10 years old and now he is he was feeling something and he used to ask his mother uh, see father he is daily walking and he is so fit and now you are getting fat and your weight is increasing so now we have to tell him something age appropriate that what is going on okay but back there in india the system is that you cannot share anything with the children you should uh, just say no you should not ask this kind kind of question come on go from here and now they are going and discussing among themselves what is happening to mother why stomach is going day by day and and like this and like this is something they are discussing and we are telling no 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 we should not talk to them but if age appropriate we say that inshallah this you are three now there will be one more uh, family member increasing so they are not oh one more family member is coming and this is the way they come okay this is how allah subhanahu taala has made so it is age appropriate ah okay allah has made and now they will discuss that this is due to a family member is going to come into our home and that's why mama is like this and after that she will be uh, she is not like if we have to meet we have to sit in them so if the same sex same gender issue is there before they are taught in the school in some or the other manner age appropriate content should be created and we should discuss with them we should discuss with them and when they will go to school they will come to know that this is legal and this is legal in this uh, uh, country but my religion says this is this one another example is that when we were i think so in fourth or fifth grade uh, that time we were having theory of evolution okay all those thing evolution and all evolution was there but at home my father and my mother they told me uh, that you will now get uh, in your syllabus a theory which will say that the human beings were monkeys sometime and now they evolved to human beings but the fact is that there there was a creation and this is the story of adam and how allah created him and all those things then when we went to school it was clear into our mind this evolution is what we have to study and we have to write but we don't have to believe this this was taught at home so we were, so like this we have to do something if it's compulsory then at school we uh, before school we have to create some age appropriate content so that we can teach them thank you sir jazakumullah